ugly instincts. We're looking at those aspects of our lives that can be so ugly, so unchristlike, that Jesus decided to take them head on. The Bible is very easy to understand. We pretend to be unable to understand it because we know very well that the minute we understand, we are obliged to act accordingly. Judge not, or you too will be judged. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. What he is referring to is the ugly instinct that we all have to make a full and final judgment about another person's worth and value as a human being. When we pray for and forgive the people who have hurt us, who've done wrong against us, when we refuse to play the devil's game, when we refuse to add any more pain or hate or violence or suffering into the world, that is victory over Satan. And the only reason at all that we have any hope of salvation, any hope of a restored relationship with God, any hope of being changed from the inside out is because Jesus chose to love and not judge. And because He lives, we can experience genuine, unconditional love for others that is completely impossible apart from the love of Jesus. Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Bridge. So glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. I'm Dan Slagle. I serve as the care and missions pastor here at Faith Bridge. And as the video pointed out, we are in the midst of a series that we're calling Ugly Instincts. Those uh, behaviors that we all exhibit from time to time that are not particularly consistent with being a Christ follower. And Jesus felt so strongly about some of these behaviors that he decided to address them directly. And he did so in a portion of scripture known as the Sermon on the Mount. That's found in the Gospel of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament. That's where we're going to be this morning. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. If you need a Bible, just raise your hands. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. Matthew chapter 5. Today we're going to be talking about the ugly instinct of anger. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the gift of your word, and for the privilege that we have to gather here in perfect freedom and without fear, to lift up the name of your son, Jesus, and to look into your written word. We pray now that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, just as you promised, and guide us into all truth. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. So if you drive up and down Stubner Airline much, you are aware that just north of here at the intersection of Stubner and Spring Cypress, they are installing some long overdue and much needed turn lanes. Can I hear an amen for that? Amen. And as is typically the case with this sort of construction, there are frequently traffic snarls. And uh, I managed to find myself in one of these traffic jams just this past week. They've had to narrow the two lanes down to one lane. And uh, I was in the wrong lane, needing to get over. And, you know, usually in these situations, people are generally pretty 
uh, agreeable about this sort of thing, good-natured about it, because we've, we've all been in the wrong lane at one time or another. It's like, okay, come, come on over, but not on this day. <laughs> no, I got beside this guy who, for whatever reason, was bound and determined that I was not coming over. And he just stayed you know, right there with me. And of course, he didn't have the courage to look at me, a coward. He's just looking straight ahead. And I've got my blinker on, you, you know, trying to get his attention to no avail. I'm thinking to myself, come on, you jerk. What's it going to take out of your day? All of two seconds to just let me over and keep, keep moving? But no, he would have none of it. And so, you know, I hit the button. I'm rolling down the passenger window. <laughs> And it was a faith bridger. A faith bridger that I know. And that knows me. Never did look at me. So I don't know if that would have made any difference or not. But I was steamed. And of course, then I find out I'm preaching this passage today. On anger. And what a passage it is. I mean, talk about setting a high bar. My goodness. I mean, getting angry is akin to killing someone. Calling someone a fool is a ticket to hell. And whatever happened to sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never hurt me. What is Jesus getting at here? It sounds very, very serious, almost out of reach. Are we to take Jesus' words at face value, or should we recognize that, no, as a gifted teacher, Jesus is simply using hyperbole to make a point? Well, I'm not sure that it's either one. I mean, certainly what Jesus is saying has value, and he is definitely making a point. But I think if we're going to understand what Jesus is saying to us, and more importantly, if we're going to apply what Jesus is saying to us, we're going to have to dig a little bit deeper, a little deeper than the surface. And I think a good place to start is to first of all determine what Jesus is not talking about here. Jesus is not prohibiting us from any and all expressions of anger. He's not doing that. As our creator, as a fellow human being, Jesus was perfectly aware that anger is a normal human emotion. It is unavoidable throughout our lifetimes. Jesus himself was prone to express anger. On certain occasions, he was known to take a whip and drive people out of the temple, the money changers. That sounds pretty angry to me. He even engaged in some rather choice name-calling toward the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So Jesus understood anger is normal. Anger is a part of our lives. And on certain occasions, in certain situations, anger is entirely appropriate. Now, what might some of those situations be? Well, one that comes to mind is what I'll call the anger of righteousness. When I was about eight or nine years old, I decided it would be a good idea to go on a snooping mission in my older brother's closet, bedroom closet. And in the course of my snooping, I came across a magazine that I had absolutely no business looking at. I had never seen anything like it. And for about three or four minutes, I sat there on his bedroom floor in a state of shock and awe when suddenly I detected another presence in the room. And the next thing I know, I am being lifted off the floor by my ear, by my mother. And in her face is a look of 
absolute fury. That's the only word to describe. She was furious. And as I reflected on that experience, it it occurred to me, uh, her anger was not primarily at me. She was plenty angry at me. But the primary object of her anger was the fact that there was a such thing as pornography at all. And that we lived in such a broken world where women would be subjected to that kind of thing. That they would submit to that sort of thing. And that men would be willing to use them for those denigrating sorts of purposes. She was angry that it had found its way into her home. And that it was impacting destructively the lives of her sons. She was righteously angry. And I think had every reason to be so. I don't think Jesus was displeased with that anger at all. There's also the anger of justice. The anger that in the late 1800s drove men like William Wilberforce and Frederick Douglass to denounce the wickedness of human slavery and to do everything in their power to bring the slave trade to an end. It's the anger that prompted a woman in the early 1900s by the name of Amy Carmichael to leave her home in Scotland and to go to India and to pour out her life literally rescuing girls from temple prostitution. It's the anger that prompted men like Martin Luther King Jr. and Desmond Tutu to stand up to racial inequality, racial prejudice. It's the anger that prompted a man like Rob Morris to start a ministry called Love 146. Some of you may recall several years ago, Rob was here to tell us about that ministry. It's a ministry that is designed to rescue girls from human trafficking. And Love 146 to this day remains one of our most vital ministry and mission partners No, there is a time and a place for anger and there are certain situations where it is absolutely appropriate and necessary. But again, that's not what Jesus is talking about here. No, the kind of anger that Jesus is addressing here is a destructive sort of anger. An anger that exists, an anger that is exhibited in order to put down, to denigrate other human beings... An anger that has absolutely uh, no value, nothing worthwhile about it. Nothing good can come of it, nothing constructive about it, nothing redemptive about it. Its primary purpose is to put people down, to exact revenge. And in some cases of rather twisted reasoning logic to make ourselves feel better about us in the course of putting others down. It is a purely destructive sort of thing that has no redemptive purposes whatsoever. That's the sort of anger that Jesus is talking about here. It's the sort of anger that you and I on various occasions have had toward other people and have shown toward other people. And the really dangerous thing about this kind of anger is that we can so easily justify it in our own minds. It's so easy to come to a place of thinking we have every right to feel this destructive anger towards someone else. Four or five years ago, a faith bridger came to see me because of a broken relationship with another faith bridger. He sat in my office and he told me how at one point in time, he and this other guy had been really the best of friends. But through a seri- an unfortunate series of events, they found themselves on opposite sides of a particular issue And after a while, they had become practically sworn enemies. And both of them felt absolutely justified in their anger toward one another. I mean, these are guys that at one time had been fishing buddies who had double dated with their wives and spent time together as families, but now, no siree, nothing to do with one another. 
nothing but ill will toward the other. And I'll never forget one thing that he said to me in the course of his confession. He said, Dan, I, I knew I was in trouble with regard to the state of my own soul when I realized my heart had turned to stone toward this person whom I had formerly loved. It had turned to stone and I liked it. And I felt completely justified in it. That's when I knew something was wrong. That's the kind of anger that Jesus is getting at here. That anger that sneaks up on us and takes us over and before you know it, we're telling ourselves why we have every right to feel this way even though it is destroying relationships. And that's the big problem that Jesus has with it. It is destructive. He said to me, you know, for all practical purposes, this individual had become dead to me. And right there, at that point, right there, is what Jesus was talking about when he compared this kind of anger to murder. Murder is taking someone's physical existence, destroying their physical existence. But to be angry with someone in this destructive sort of way is to behave as though they never existed at all. They may as well be dead to you. The net effect, the net result is the same. And so Jesus is absolutely right when he says, you heard it said, you shall not murder, but I say to you, even if you are angry, You've committed murder in your heart. You have so devalued that other person that they may as well not even exist. Now perhaps you think to yourself, well, okay, Pastor Dan, I, I, I can see the destructive nature of anger. And I can see that it, it has no place in the heart of a Christ follower, but I mean... Hell? I mean, we're, we can get sent to hell for being angry, for calling someone a name? No. I mean, there's really only one decision that lands a person in hell, and that is the full and final rejection of Jesus as our Savior. But you know, friends, you don't have to go to hell to experience hell. And if you've ever been around someone who is perpetually angry, who has this destructive nature of anger about them, you know just how hellish it can be. And how capable it is of taking life. Jesus has a real problem with that sort of anger because it is completely contrary to the gospel. The gospel is all about life. The impartation of new life. The gospel is all about forgiveness in order to receive that life. But this sort of anger is all about destruction and death. There's nothing redemptive about it. And when that sort of anger lodges itself in our hearts, don't think for a minute that it limits itself to just one relationship. It does not limit itself any more than cancer limits itself to one organ in our bodies. If we have a diagnosis of cancer anywhere in our body and it's left unattended, we do nothing about it, it will spread and it will eventually consume us. And anger works exactly the same way. It may start with one broken relationship, but eventually it's going to impact every relationship in our lives. It's going to impact every area of our lives. Destructive anger has unbelievable power to consume and destroy. I have a friend whose favorite pastime is rehearsing old grievances perpetrated against him. 
catalog-like memory for practically every slight, every wound, every insult he's ever received over the course of his life. And he can remember them in an instant. And I've observed that sometimes in the rehearsing of these old grievances, it's like he is there again reliving it and the anger wells up from within taking him over again and I'm thinking to myself what a horrible sad way to live it sounds like hell to me to live that way it reminds me of Jacob Marley is that name familiar to you Marley, as you may know, was the business partner of Ebenezer Scrooge, Charles Dickens' novel, A Christmas Carol. And early in the story, the ghost of the late Jacob Marley appears to Ebenezer, and he is cloaked in chains. And he explains to Ebenezer, I forged this chain, these chains of mine in life. Every single greedy decision, every selfish thing I ever did added yet another link to these chains that I now carry with me. And I think in a very similar sort of fashion, those of us who live with destructive anger are fashioning and forging our own chains and we're dragging them around with us everywhere we go. And before we know it, we become enslaved to this destructive thing called anger. That sounds like hell to me. Jesus was absolutely right. Exhibiting destructive anger towards someone else is akin to murdering them because they have become dead to you. Exhibiting destructive anger toward other people will put us in a hell of our own making as we drag the chains of hate and anger and bitterness around with us everywhere we go, impacting every relationship in our lives. But the good news that I have to share with you today, friends, is that we do not have to stay there. Jesus came to rescue us from our sin. In John 8, 36, he said, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And you no longer have to be bound by the chains of anger. But the key, Jesus is very careful to say, the key to being set free from the chains of anger is reconciliation. Taking the initiative to go and to make things right with the object of our hatred. The individual, the faith bridger that I referenced a few moments ago, uh, came to a place of forgiveness and took the initiative to go to his brother and say, hey, I'm, I'm sorry. And in the aftermath of that, sent me an email and I wanted to read you just a line or two. Dan, God has done a miracle in my heart. He has spoken to me and directed my steps toward forgiveness today, revealing himself to me in his word. And I am in awe of who he is. All I can say is, Jesus is real, y'all. And as a testimony to the healing power of Jesus, I, I can add this postscript. This happened, as I say, four or five years ago. But I called this individual to get their permission to tell the story, which I always do with illustrations involving people I know. And Jesus had done such a complete healing work in this guy's life that at first, he couldn't remember what I was talking about. It was that far in the past, and the relationship had been restored. Jesus has come to set us free. 
But he doesn't wave a magic wand over us and say, poof, you're free. No, he invites us into the process. And that's why he says, if there's something between you and your brother, you go and do something about it. It doesn't matter who started the fight, whose fault it is, where the blame lies, because that's not the issue. Blame is not the issue. The issue is the condition of your heart and whether or not you're willing to submit to the lordship of Jesus. That's the real issue when it comes to reconciliation. But even as I stand here, I'm very much aware that some of you are putting on the brakes right about now and saying to me, Pastor Dan, yeah, but you just don't understand. (coughs) Blame is the issue for me. And I understand that. It has been the issue for me too. There have been times in my life I have been too proud. There have been times in my life I was too afraid. Fearful that I just would not have the strength to follow through and do what Jesus was calling me to do. And I imagine some of you are in that same boat today. Yeah, it's hard. We're not going to downplay that, but it's not impossible. And Jesus has given to us means by which we can make it possible. And one of those is to spend some time reflecting, first of all, upon what Jesus has done for you. If you want to talk about blame, friends, we are the ones to blame. Jesus was blameless. But it was our sin that caused him to suffer. It was our sin that nailed him to the cross. It was our sin that killed him. But Jesus did not wait for us to come to him for reconciliation. No, he came to each one of us in our brokenness and extends to us the possibility of forgiveness and new life and eternal life found only in him. Spend a little time thinking about how much you have been forgiven before you decide that this is just too big for you to forgive because I promise you, nothing has happened in your life that compares to what you did to Jesus. Nothing. Now, as a counseling pastor, I feel the need to say this. I'm fully aware that in some broken relationships, reconciliation is not advisable because reconciling could potentially mean even more harm to come. I'm talking about situations where abuse has happened, where one person has power over another. But that's not what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about a relationship of equals here where the relationship has been broken because of anger and all that remains to be done is for one to step out in obedience to Christ and to step forward and be reconciled to the other. And one of the things that we can do to help ourselves in that process is to spend a little time thinking about what Jesus has done for us. A second thing that we can do is to avail ourselves to the grace that Jesus makes available to all of his followers The grace that gives us strength to be obedient, to follow through, to do what he's calling us to do. Jesus never intended that you and I live the Christian life on our own. We don't have the capacity. We don't have the strength. We don't have the willpower. We don't have the discipline. We will fall short every time. But the reason Jesus gave to us the gift of the Holy Spirit was so that he might live his life through us. So that we might be the recipients of his power and his love, his mercy, his forgiveness that we can then extend to other people. And the beautiful thing about the grace of Jesus Christ is all we have to do is ask for it. It's free. It's undeserved, but it's absolutely free. And he is ready and willing to impart it to any of us who want it. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, used to talk about the means of grace, the channels, the conduits through which God's grace is imparted to us. And he identified the Lord's table 
as one of those means of grace. A place where we can come and receive what we do not have. And that's why we thought it would be especially fitting today for us to gather at the Lord's table to spend some time reflecting on what Jesus has done for us, that he did, in fact, allow his body to be broken. And it was our fault. That he did permit his blood to be shed for the forgiveness of our sin. We need to spend some time thinking about that But we also need to spend time at his table receiving the spiritual nourishment that only he can provide that will give us the fortitude and the courage and the wherewithal and the strength to take that first step of reconciliation, to swallow our pride and to be like Jesus. If we could see one another with spiritual eyes this morning with the eyes of Jesus I have a strong suspicion that we would see lots of chains here this morning some of us are lugging around long links that we've been forging for quite a while some of us maybe even added a couple of links this week but I've come to tell you today you can be free And you can leave the ugly instinct of destructive anger behind. As I thought about this message and I thought about our time down here at the front, I had the image in my mind of people coming and receiving and as they went back to their seats, the front area being covered in a pile of chains that had been left behind. Because Jesus took them from us and gave us what we needed. And so today you're invited. You're invited to come to his table. And I want to encourage you to use this time to think about, Jesus, what you have done for me. And Jesus, please give me what I need. So that when I leave here, I can go and do what you are clearly calling me to do. In just a few moments, in in both of our rooms, the ushers will be guiding us to the front, to the stations that we have. Here at Faith Bridge, we have what we call an open table. That is to say, all are welcome. Anyone who has a relationship with Jesus or anyone who would like to have a relationship with Jesus is certainly welcome to come. As the ushers guide you down front to a particular station, you're going to find a basket that is filled with gluten-free crackers, as that is an issue for many. Take the cracker, dip it in the cup, and then partake. If you need to spend some time down here praying and reflecting, you are welcome to do that. Otherwise, we would ask that you please return to your seat and not leave, because we are still worshiping, And it's a sign of honor and respect to those who have not yet received that we might do this together as community and as the body of Christ. And then once we have all partaken, we will sing and then be dismissed. Let me pray for us and then the ushers will lead us forward. Father, we are more grateful than words can say that when we broke faith with you and chose to sin and go our own way, you were not filled with pride, but you humbly, humbly came and rescued us. You took the initiative. And because you did that, we are a changed people. I pray for myself And I pray for all of my brothers and sisters here as we come to receive your broken body and your shed blood. May they be for us grace. Grace that fills our hearts with forgiveness and mercy and love and humility. And grace that enables us to go and reconcile 
and be the men and women that you are calling us to be. Leaving that ugly instinct of destructive anger behind. And we all pray our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen and amen.